This is the Consciousness Podcast, and I'm your host, Stuart Preston. Each episode, I have a conversation with an expert in human consciousness. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Schechter, who is an assistant professor of philosophy and philosophy of neuroscience psychology in the Department of Philosophy and in the Philosophy of Neuroscience Psychology program at the Washington University in St. Louis. Her work centers on questions of psychological unity with a focus on split brain, which you can find in her book, Self-Consciousness and Split Brains, The Mind's Eye. We had a great conversation and covered consciousness, split brains, and the mind-body problem, and much more. Please enjoy this episode with Dr. Elizabeth Schechter. Dr. Schechter, so thanks again for for being here on the Consciousness Podcast. Um, Thanks for having me. The first question, thanks, is uh, when I was looking at your website, I saw this term psychological unity and Mm -hmm. unity of consciousness. And I don't even know if it's relevant to our conversation today, but I got stuck on it. Okay. And I thought, well, maybe I need maybe I need to understand what this is in order to give some context to the rest of the question. So whether or not it's relevant, yeah. um, could you just tell us like what what does that mean to psychological unity? I think it's relevant. So uh, psychological unity isn't any one thing. There are many forms of psychological unity um, that you might think characterize the human mind. So for instance, um, you might think that, well, people have a kind of um, consistency of character and personality across time. And uh, that would be one form of psychological unity. Or you might think, uh, uh, okay, so there's a kind of continuity of memory. So if someone has a two-year period of their life that they can't remember, then that's a form of psychological unity that they lack, at least to some extent. Whereas if you, you know, can remember every period of your life, then that's another form of psychological unity that you have. Various kinds of rational unity. So um, economists talk about transitivity of preferences. So if you prefer A to B and you prefer B to C, then you should prefer A to C. Um, And if that's so, if your preferences are transitive, then that's another kind of rational unity. So, uh, or another kinds of psychological unity. And so psychological unity is interesting for two different reasons. I mean, one is that, Uh, philosophers have thought that interpersonal life, that um, law and order are kinds of uh, normative expectations of people and how they should behave, that all of these require or presuppose that people are psychologically unified in one sense or another. And then you can, you can look at inter, you know, our interpersonal expectations and our normative expectations and requirements of people. And you can try to figure out which forms of psychological unity are presupposed by them. Um, and, and these sorts of claims are always very controversial, i.e. it's always controversial to what extent psychological unity is actually presupposed um, by interpersonal life. Um, but a second reason, and this is more relevant to my research, a second reason why psychological unity is interesting from a philosophical standpoint is that if you think that what we are fundamentally is psychological beings and that the conditions of mm-hmm. my being a single person as opposed to multiple persons or the conditions of my being the same person now that I was a year ago, are psychological conditions, then it's going to turn out that a person's identity and individuality will consist in their being psychologically unified in one or more of these senses. And then the interesting work becomes, you know, the interesting work becomes to figure out which kinds of psychological unity are required for me to be the same person I am now that I was a year ago, or for me to be one person person as opposed to multiple persons. So my work, you know, especially my work on the split brain phenomenon is an empirically informed work on personal identity, on what it is for us to be a single thinker, a single subject of experience or agent or person. And so throughout the book, I'm dealing with, okay, again, what are these different forms of psychological unity and which of them are required for us to be unitary as agents or subjects of experience and so on. So um, the unity becomes the person, the unity of the of different yeah, minds or brains or experiences. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, my being a unitary person will consist in my being psychologically unified in one or more senses. Right. Yeah. And what about consciousness? Is there a unity of, of consciousness yeah. per se? Yeah, I mean, unity of consciousness is interesting partly because, um, you know, I'm a philosopher of psychology and philosophers of psychology at this point are, I think on the whole, really pretty skeptical of most claims of psychological unity. People are skeptical that actually we 
you are that consistent at the level of character. At least this is what's said. I, I wonder whether I, my view is that implicitly people are still pretty committed to viewing each other as psychologically unified in, in certain key senses. But, you know, explicitly philosophers of psychology tend to be a pretty skeptical bunch. And they say, look at all this empirical research demonstrating that, for instance, what people do when they're faced with a moral dilemma can't best be explained by some, you know, deep set of values people are really committed to, but rather is determined by just the, the situational factors. Um, everything from who's around you, who's watching you, to how much sleep you got last night. Um, so there's a lot of skepticism about various forms of psychological unity. It's pretty common in the literature to, you know, hear people say things like, well, we now know that people aren't Rash, highly rationally unified or, you know, that memory right. is, you know, very inaccurate in a lot of ways rather than being a faithful and consistent record of our lives and so on. But conscious unity is a little different. I mean, I think a lot of philosophers think that this might be the one form of psychological unity that's pretty robust, um, although obviously there's skepticism even there. So the unity of consciousness there's several different concepts of conscious unity. Um, and one that I think is quite fundamental, and this is the one that's of most interest to philosophers of conscious unity, is the concept of phenomenal unity. So I don't know if you've already spoken about on your podcast, like Nagel's work, what it's like to be a bat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, yeah, and actually you know, I have that question a little later on for you, but yeah, so uh, I don't mean to interrupt. So where, where are you going with that? Well, so Nagel says effectively that a bee being is conscious if there's something that it's like to be that being. Or in other words, right. to be conscious is to have a perspective on the world, a point of view on the world. So if you, if you take that notion of phenomenal consciousness, that's become the most common way, I think, of articulating the concept of phenomenal consciousness. Um, we can derive from that a concept of phenomenal unity or what it is to have a phenomenally unified consciousness. So if to be phenomenally conscious is to have a perspective, then to, be, uh, to have a phenomenally unified consciousness is to have just a single perspective, for there to be just a single thing that it's like to be you at any moment in time. Um, and that's one right. conception of, of what it is to have a unified consciousness. And that's sometimes called a conception of, um, you might think creature consciousness. So a uh, property a whole animal can have, but often in consciousness mm -hmm. literature, we're interested in state consciousness instead, which is a property right. that some mental states have and some mental states lack. Um, and often when you're talking about state consciousness, you know, it's more useful to think of a, a mental state as being conscious if it's available to introspection, for instance, or if it's available to guide practical reasoning, to rationally guide action, and so on. And from that, we could derive a second concept of conscious unity, which we might call um, access unity. So you might say two states are access unified if they are jointly available to introspection or they're available to jointly guide practical reasoning. Uh, Right. Um, as available only individually. So those are, I think, the two major concepts of conscious unity. Although, again, I would okay. say, yeah, yeah, I would say that the notion of phenomenal unity is of particular interest to philosophers of conscious unity. Yeah, I think based on my con previous conversations, I would agree with that. So where do you go from, from there? And, and how do you maybe in, in as simple terms as we can do? how do you describe or define or view human consciousness? What, what, what is that? And I mean, maybe, maybe in the context of duality, yeah. you know, physicalism, those kind of things. And what, what is the yeah. relationship of a person to that mind? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I am open to the possibility of minds that aren't conscious, uh, um, phenomenally conscious or I suppose access conscious, although that becomes a little trickier. Um, consciousness, at least in the sense of sentience, is uh, you know widely recognized to be one of the conditions of personhood. Although I could see arguing against that in certain ways too, but that would be a very radical position. Um, self consciousness is universally recognized to be a condition of personhood, but self consciousness is different again from consciousness because self-consciousness is a kind of cognitive capacity, right? The ability to conceptualize oneself as a psychological being, as the thinker of one's own thoughts. Um, the awareness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, you know, again, awareness of oneself as a psychological being, but that might be different from phenomenal right. consciousness. Maybe it is possible to be self-conscious, um, to have this cognitive capacity, to have the, to possess the concept of an I, right? A being that, again, can explicitly re refer to itself, a being that is the thinker of its own thoughts without somehow there being something that it's like to be you. But again, that's a very, I know philosophers who have argued for positions along these lines. Um, Peter Carruther once famously argued that animals aren't conscious, or at least most non-human animals aren't conscious. Um, but he said, you know, they still have minds, they still have desires, they still uh, are worthy the of moral consideration because they still have things they want to have happen to them and things that they don't want to have happen to them. Um, but again, that's right. a pretty radical position. Normally consciousness is viewed as a very basic capacity, much simpler than self-consciousness and uh, as a capacity that really any being with a mind would have. Um, yeah. And that's why we can take on the question of something that's like to be that bat. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and Nagel Cho is a bat because he said, you know, on the one hand, intuitively, they're very different from us. So we, you know, we, it seems to us partly because, you know, they echolocate um, or I, I guess mainly because they echolocate, but also I would say because they lack a number of the conceptual and cognitive capacities that we have. We're not sure what it's like to be a bat. Um, it seems to us difficult to actually put ourselves into, project ourselves into their point of view. On the other hand, he said, we're really confident that they have a point of view, right? They're mammals. We assume that there's something it's right. like to be a bat, that we can't just access it. We can't know what it is. Um, in terms of du uh, you know dualism and physicalism, it's become less and less clear to me what physicalism is really, but because I find physicalism hard to formulate, I mean, dualism is impossible to formulate since it's defined, I, I take it kind of negatively against um, physicalism. Mm. So I certainly, right. you know, I, I, I'm always a little wary of calling myself a physicalist these days just because I'm not to totally sure what it means, but I'm certainly not a dualist. Um, and I assume, right. you know, in my work that the mind and all its properties are, that they supervene in some way or determine in some way or subserved in some way by neural processes and properties. Right. Yeah, and that'll, that'll bear into the, the following uh, conversations because, you know, as you know, and as you've even directed me, that uh, the primary topic for you is the, the work in uh, split brains. Right. And understanding, you know, what's going on there. And so I, I'm definitely excited to talk to you about that and having, having your perspective on consciousness and now how you feel about, you know, physicalism, dual, dualism, those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. It's going to definitely shed some light on this. So, okay. um, yeah, let's do a quick introduction. So tell, tell, give us a little background on what split brain is, you know, the basis yeah. of what, what you're talking about as far as separating the two sides and where that came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, Split brain surgery is a colloquial term for surgery that cuts through the corpus callosum, the largest white matter tract in the human brain, uh, which connects mm -hmm. the cerebral hemispheres. And some of these surgeries are, have cut through additional white matter fiber tracts connecting the two cerebral hemispheres as well. And a number of these split brain surgeries were performed on adults in the United States in the second half of the 20th century as a treatment for severe cases of epilepsy. But although they were performed on human beings for strictly medical purposes, um, unsurprisingly, the surgeries have some psychobehavioral consequences. Effectively, after they're surgically separated from each other in this way, the two hemispheres of the brain begin to operate unusually independently of each other uh, in the realm of perception, cognition, and the control of action. So, so these split brain studies and the split brain subjects who agreed to participate in them after undergoing these surgeries have attracted just an incredible amount of interdisciplinary attention um, for a number of reasons. But I mean, the, the primary reason for the inter interdisciplinarity of the attention they attracted is that, um, especially under experimental conditions where the partial functional independence of these two hemispheres was revealed, it seemed to a lot of people that, wow, these hemispheres, it's almost as if each of them has a mind and a stream of consciousness of its own. Um, and right. so, yeah, they were of obvious philosophical relevance to various claims about, about the unity of mind and the unity of the person and the unity of consciousness. Um, so just to give an example of a split brain experiment of the kind of result that elicits this intuition of mental duality and of conscious duality, um, 
maybe it's easiest to understand in the case of tactile sensation. So each hand sends uh, fine grain tactile information of the sort that would be used to recognize an object by touch directly to the opposite mm -hmm. hemisphere. So suppose you blindfold a split brain subject and you put a familiar object, say a pen, in the subject's right hand first. Um, and you ask them what it is they're holding. So they feel the pen and they say, okay, it's a pen. All right, so far so good. Now you take a different familiar object, say a pipe, and you put it in the subject's left hand and you ask him what he's holding. And, you know, prototypically he says uh, that he doesn't know. He may say that his uh, left hand is numb, that he can't really feel it. This is because tactile information about the pipe has been sent directly to the right hemisphere, but in the majority of the split brain population, the right hemisphere is mute. It lacks a capacity for spoken language. But if you now, mm. now ask the, you take the object away and you put it into a box of other objects and you ask the subject while still blindfolded to reach into that box of objects using the left hand and select the object that he was holding a moment ago, um, he easily selects the pipe. Or if you give him a pencil and a sheet of paper, he will draw a pipe. He may even be able to write the word pipe. He just can't speak it. And that's, again, because, you know, apparently the pipe was felt and recognized and has now been remembered. And, um, you know, a representation of the pipe is being used to direct an intentional action, like selecting a pipe or drawing the pipe in response to experimental request. But it simply can't guide a speech act, again, because information about the pipe is, con is now confined to the right hemisphere, which again lacks this capacity for spoken language. So again, it's this sort of result that seemed to, you know, intuitively, it, it evokes what I call in my book, the duality intuition, the, du the intuition that there are these two distinct conscious beings within a split brain subject, a left hemisphere conscious being that felt and recognized and remembered and reported having felt um, a pen. And then a second right hemisphere conscious being that felt and recognized and remembered, and in a sense reported, but not verbally reported, having felt um, the pipe. Yeah, so there's two, but, so what do you think? Do you think there's two independent consciousnesses in these subjects? Yeah. I mean, it depends on what you mean by independent in a way. So I think that there are, yeah, and I argue- yeah, It's funny because you surprised me with the word yes. I was expecting a, a no yeah. there, because in listening to you describe the different parts of the brain and what they're doing, I was starting to pull back from this notion of independent consciousnesses. So oh, that's interesting. So, so yes. I'll, I'll give my answer, but I'm interested first in your answer. Why do you think that there, why were you pulling away from the view that there were two independent consciousnesses? I don't know. I think maybe because maybe I have a, a larger, um, less neurological view of, of I consciousness. And, I, and, I, and I'll be honest with you. Every time I talk to one of you guys, <laughs> um, I don't know what I think anymore. Right. <laughs> you know, so my, my views change and I, I've gone from all the way on one side to complete duality to all the way on the other side, complete physicalism. And then, then I just get more confused and that's why I continue to talk yep. to you guys. So <laughs> that's why we're here, you know, to people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, I'm so grateful that I, that I get these opportunities. So I guess I was thinking to myself, yeah. well, I see this physical brain that's been separated and right. what we have here is just a, a failure to communicate. I'm not trying to pull a funny right, line right, from a yeah. movie, but okay, well, let me, they just let don't, me to, they're not separate. So I'd like to hear what, yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me try to push harder. So suppose you were shown two objects. Let's stick with pen and pipe. Let's say you're visually presented with two objects. Um, you can say whether these were the same or different, right? In a simple um, comparison. Right. Um, suppose I were shown two objects, I would also be able to say whether they were the same or different. Okay, now suppose you were shown one object, but just one, and I was shown a second object, but just one, and now each of us was asked whether the objects were the same or different. Well, obviously, unless we can compare notes, unless I can tell you what I saw, and you, or you can tell me what you saw, neither of us will be able to say whether the two objects were the same or different, because of course, Neither of us was presented with two objects. Uh, from our perspective, I mean, each of us was conscious of only a single object. Okay, so you get arguably a similar kind of result in split brain subjects. So if you present two objects just to the right hemisphere by presenting them both in the left visual hemifield, each hemisphere consciously sees, this is a bit of a simplification, but in the main, each hemisphere consciously sees only a single side of space. So if you present two mm -hmm. objects just on the left, so the only the right hemisphere sees them, the subject can say whether the objects were the same or different. You present two objects only on the right, so that only the left hemisphere can see them, 
the subject can indicate whether the objects were the same or different. Now you present two objects, one on each side of space, so that each is sent to a different hemisphere. And now the subject is at chance at saying whether the objects were the same or different. And again, it seems as though that's because, you know, one of the objects reached consciousness in one hemisphere, the other object reached consciousness in the other hemisphere, but no one was conscious of both objects. So it's as if there was a right hemisphere subject of experience conscious of what was on the left and a left hemisphere subject of experience conscious of what was on the right, but no subject of experience conscious of both what was on the right and on the left. Um, so, you know, and that's called a cross comparison task, or it's actually called a cross matching task in the literature. So that's another kind of result that, you know, again, often, though, you know, not always, and you may be an exception, evokes this intuition, at least, that there are these two independent consciousnesses and, and you know, in, indeed, two independent subjects of these conscious experiences. I, on the one hand, I want to say, it depends on what you mean by independent consciousness. So I do argue yeah. there are these two distinct streams or centers of consciousness in a split brain subject, um, at least in the sense that there appear to be two distinct phenomenal perspectives, two things at any one moment that it's like to be a split brain subject, a kind of right hemisphere associated thing that it's like to be a split brain subject and a left hemisphere associated thing that it's like to be a split brain subject. On the other hand, they obviously, these consciousnesses obviously aren't causally independent. Um, I mean, the two hemispheres are, interacting with each other all the time um, because they share one body. And so if one of them acts on the basis of its conscious experience, the other will perceive the action. Or if one of them, you know, initiates, say, a gaze shift, um, since they share a pair of eyes, this will now affect what the other hemisphere sees and so on. And, and there may be more intimate relationships between their conscious experiences as well. Um, so one claim that is there was a, an awareness is, of, is there an awareness between the two of the other one no there does like not a siamese seem, twin yeah no there does not seem to be so um it may be that they share certain conscious experiences there is a one model of split brain consciousness the partial unity of model which i have you know given at least a tentative defense of in the literature. Um, and according to this model, they share some experiences. But on the other hand, no, neither seems to be aware that it's sharing experiences with the other or that there is a second conscious being sharing its body. They appear to be wholly unaware of each other's existence. Wholly unaware. So it's not like they can't even, they don't even... So in this case, one side cannot even recognize the other. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the case of conjoined twins, there's a crucial difference there, which is that conjoined twins, you know, even if you look at uh, um, Brittany and Abigail Hensel are conjoined twins who are joined um, at the level of the torso and below, but mm -hmm. they still have um, two heads, two faces, um, two distinct nervous systems, it's believed, although their behavior is so mutually um, their behavior is so coordinated that uh, apparently some doctors are kind of skeptical that their nervous systems can really be um, wholly distinct. But, um, but yeah. you know, they, they can look mm -hmm. at each other, right? And they can talk to each other. They have different mouths and different voices. Um, if you yeah. look at another really interesting pair of conjoined twins, Krista and Tatiana Hogan, who are joined at the level of the thalamus. And so it looks as though it, it seems possible that they too actually share some experiences. So, um, how, how deep in the brain is the the thalamus? I mean, how, how like what is there like a percentage of the brain that they're sharing? Well, I mean, on the one hand, it's not. It depends on what you mean by sharing in a certain way, right? I mean, if you look at the MRIs, yeah. it's pretty mind blowing. I mean, the thing is, the thalamus isn't. It's not particularly large, but it's been called the sensory relay station of the brain because mm -hmm. every uh, sensory perceptual inf information of every modality except olfaction passes through the thalamus on the way to the cortex. And so right. it seems, you know, even though it's a kind of small structure, it's very important. It plays a major role in a, a you know, a number of mm. neurobiological theories of consciousness um, because it's believed to play a role in kind of synchronizing the activity of the two hemispheres as well. So even though it's a physically small part of the brain that's joined, it may have really significant functional effects. And again, there's some, you know, there's at least some reason to think that 
uh, for instance, if one girl closes her eyes, but you show an object to the other sister, the first sister, you know, if she concentrates, is able to, it looks as though she's able to say what her sister is looking at. Um, wow. So there appears to be some shared visual experiences between the two sisters. But again, they're aware of each other's existence for, you know, partly for what may seem like uninteresting reasons. I mean, again, two heads, two faces, two bodies. Also, you know, if you, from the research I've done into this, it looks as though the parents of conjoined twins go out of their way to emphasize to their children that they are two distinct psychological beings. So in the case of Brittany and Abigail Hensel, for instance, the conjoined twins who are joined at the level of the torso, I thought this was really interesting. So their mother, um, you know, these girls, they've, they've been together, I mean, literally together, physically joined their whole lives. And, you know, there are personality differences between the two of them, but they're strikingly you know, similar in a lot of ways too. They there was a reality TV show about them for a while, and you notice that they not only finish each other's sentences, but they'll often you know start and stop speaking sentences entirely together. Um, and again, their wow. behavior is incredibly unified. They can not only drive a car together, but they can um, you know they were on the softball team in high school. They could apparently hit a softball, which is more you know that's more coordination than Wait, many. No. Um, but yeah. their, their, you know, their parents really, certainly their mother, I read more about their mother, went out of her way to emphasize to the two girls that they were distinct, you know, distinct persons. And, and why wouldn't she? I mean, they face sometimes other little children would sometimes come up to them and say, oh, look, you know, a girl with two heads. And they would have to right. explain like, no, we're, you know, two girls, each with one head. And uh, their mother would, for instance, on their birthday, even though they obviously share a birthday, they would each get their own cake. Apparently, when they flew on planes, um, their parents would buy them different plane tickets, even though they obviously mm -hmm. occupy only one seat. And even though, you know, plane tickets are expensive, so you might think that would be a place where their parents wanted to economize. But again, it was just right. to emphasize to them that, no, you're distinct psychological beings. No one has ever done That's that nice. for the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of a split brain subject. No one has ever encouraged them to recognize each other as distinct beings, so far as I can tell. Um, and even a lot of the neuropsychologists... And this isn't something... You know, we're, not, we're not still splitting brains as part of the epileptic therapy, are we? So it's no longer done, actually, I mean, partial callosotomies where you section just a portion of mm -hmm. um, the, the corpus callosum, uh, those are still performed um, even on adults, I believe. And it may be that full callosotomies are still performed on children in the United States, um, although I'm, I'm not certain about this. But interestingly, if you section the corpus callosum at a young enough age, you don't get the kinds of results that I described before. Um, you can really? still observe certain kinds of dissociations between the two hemispheres, but yeah, no, you don't get the sort of striking behavioral dissociations that I described before. So the really interest, all the interesting split brain studies we know of were studies that were done on people who, you know, their brains had already developed so as to be dependent on the corpus callosum for a lot of integration between the two hemispheres. And so then when you get rid of the corpus callosum, you see these striking dissociations, but when it's, um, when it's sectioned at a young age, you don't see the same results. And interestingly, I mean, children, their corpus callosum hasn't fully developed. The fibers haven't um, completed. Uh, yeah. Validation. So um, you might so think. So compensating that uh, continuing to mature in a way that it. Right, exactly. And there's neuroplasticity, should. obviously, at that age. There's other pathways that can come to take on, you know, some of the same functions. Yeah. So today um, we don't, uh, and I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but today we don't have as many, if any, subjects to to study and, and ask the questions like you just asked, like if yeah, if a split brain person has ever been asked, do you yeah, feel so like these, two different people? Yeah, these surgeries were performed. I mean, they were performed mainly in the '60s. So the you know mm. split brain population in the United States, I don't know if any of them are still studied at this point because some of them are still surviving, but they're pretty old. I think NG was in some. Right at least neuroimaging experiences, uh, experiments recently. But um, there were some more recent split brain surgeries in Italy, and those subjects are still being studied. Uh, the neuroscientists, with, you know, mainly under the, uh, the primary uh, writer of these works is um, Yer Pinto, the neuroscientist Yer Pinto. And so those split brain studies have received a lot of attention recently, partly because he didn't, you know, he didn't find any, hemisphere field interaction effects. I mean, he didn't find 
all the dissociations that are sometimes, you know, that are classically reported for the United States patients. Um, the subject series is a little different because um, his split brain subjects are a little, their intelligence is somewhat lower than that mm -hmm. of many of the, uh, for whatever reason, many of the American split brain patients. And you may get more interesting results with those American split brain subjects as well, but I'm not really sure. I mean, it's kind of controversial to what extent his results are. There's huge individual mm -hmm. differences between split brain subjects. And that's partly because by the time you're a candidate for the procedure, your epilepsy is so severe that it's really causing progressive brain damage and no two right. people's brains will be damaged in quite the same way and no two people will recover from or compensate for the damage in quite the same way. So it's a little difficult to generalize about split brain subjects. But I argue in my book that, you know, for at least a subset of these subjects, and I actually name them, um, it looks as though they really did have two streams of consciousness um, and two minds apiece. Right. Well, and when you look at that, I think uh, one of the things I I read or heard from you is is perspectives versus agents versus right. thinkers. Yeah. And so, tell us a little bit about what what are the differences among those three distinctions. So. And how uh, and how does it play in the consciousness? If I could be yeah, selfish and tilt sure. it our way. Well, perspectives are the only ones that are you know perspectives are. I define consciousness in terms of perspective. So to be conscious is to have a perspective. Um, mm -hmm. To be an agent, on the other hand, is to be, you know, a being that acts intentionally on the basis of goals and desires and plans and, you know, ultimately intentions that are formed, um, formed at the conclusion of practical reasoning. And to be a mm -hmm. thinker is to is to have a mind, is to have, you know, some at least psychological properties, but arguably, you know, some full set of psychological properties. So to be a thinker, you need to be um, capable of believing things and wanting things and making decisions um, and so on. So in principle, you might think that a being might be too simple to qualify as an agent or to qualify as a thinker, but might still have a perspective, perhaps a very minimal, a very bare perspective. I mean, something so simple as, you know, I don't know a tick. I remember reading once that ticks are like incredibly, if you think of them as psychological beings at all, they're incredibly simple psychological beings that perhaps just have the ability to sense, you know, um, a certain kind of chemical gradient or certain kind of, you know, warmth or something right. like that. So maybe a being with a kind of, unimaginably to us minimal conscious perspective, but still perhaps a phenomenal perspective. Maybe there is something that it's like to be a tech. On the other hand, right. it seems clear that they aren't thinkers or agents. Um, they aren't nearly psychologically uh, complex enough. Um, now, conversely, you might think maybe there could be agents or thinkers that don't have perspective. So in particular, if you think, yeah, AI might reach a level of sophistication where we really want to say that some of these machines are agents, um, that they really do engage in decision making, um, or that they really do have thoughts and beliefs and so on. But you might still be skeptical that there's anything, that there could be anything that it was like to be um, these AI agents. I mean, you, you might not be skeptical in that way, but it depends upon what you think yeah. is the basis of consciousness. Um, if you think that it requires wetware, like actual, you know, neurochemistry um, and neurobiology of the sort that we have, then yeah, you might think, sure, maybe these agents, they really will be true intentional agents and they really will have psychologies and perhaps be quite intelligent, but maybe there won't actually be anything that it's like to be them. So, you know, at least right. potentially these things can dissociate. And I think that in the split brain case, what we want to know fundamentally about split brain subjects is whether a split brain subject is one of us or two of us in one body. But the problem right. with this question is it's ambiguous because there's not just one thing that we are. Um, you know, again, each of us is a thinker, but also an agent, but also a subject of experience with a unitary perspective or so we think. So mm. it's helpful, you know, at least at the, you know, dialectically, at least it's helpful to, distinguish these questions from each other, right? Is a split brain subject one subject of experience or two subjects of experience? Is a split brain subject one thinker or two thinkers? Ultimately, I do believe that 
the answer you give to each of these questions does constrain the answers you give to uh, the others. But again, it's helpful, at least preliminarily, to begin by distinguishing them, right? And to think carefully about yeah. what, you know, again, like each of us is one psychological being in a number of different senses. And it's helpful to distinguish those senses and approaching these questions of split brain psychological unity or disunity. So when you think about the split brain subject, um, what have you noticed or seen when it comes to perspectives versus agents versus thinkers? Are, are there yeah. Yeah. any distinctions or difference there? Yeah, so what's interesting is that in the literature, the claim that split brain subjects are dual as conscious beings, that they have two perspectives, or usually the term that's used as two streams of consciousness or two centers of consciousness, mm -hmm. that enjoys a lot more support, um, or at least is you know much more frequently endorsed in the philosophical literature than is the claim that split brain subjects have two minds. And that claim that split brain subjects have two minds or that they're two thinkers is endorsed much more frequently than is the claim that they're two agents. And I think the reason is that, you know, if you move from perspectives to, or subjects of experience to thinkers to agents, you're moving closer and more and more towards, you know, concepts that have a really close connection to um, action and behavior. And split brain subjects, you know, one thing that's been repeated over and over again in, in the philosophical literature and philosophers have gotten this from neuropsychologists who work with the subjects is that split brain subjects generally behave outside of experimental conditions that they behave in a basically normal or unified fashion. And so to the extent that their action and their behavior seems normal and unified, people are really skeptical that they can really be two agents because they think if there were two agents there, two distinct sources of intentional action, wouldn't their behavior be highly disunified? Wouldn't you see a lot of conflict and, you know, perhaps even outright physical conflict between two agents forced yeah. to share one body and so on. Um, and I, I, you know, I argue in the book that actually, I mean, first of all, again, I do believe that there are connections between being a single subject of experience and being a single agent. And if you think about it, the intuition that a split brain subject has two streams of consciousness, it's rooted in, you know, I believe it's rooted in intuitions, and observations um, concerning dual agency. For instance, you know, I gave you the example before of the pen and the pipe case. Well, why does it right. seem as though there was one subject of experience that felt the pen and a different subject of experience that felt the pipe? Well, because it seems to us that there was one agent that said pen, but I didn't feel anything in my left hand. And that there was a distinct agent that selected the pipe or that drew a picture of the pipe. Right. So, you know, these intuitions, again, of dual consciousness, they're they're grounded in observations of dual agency, of divisions at the level of action control. Um, and so, you know, I, I point out in the book, we actually know a lot less about split brain subjects behavior outside of experimental conditions than people seem to think, because the neuropsychologists mm -hmm. who work with the subjects, they didn't really study them outside of experimental conditions. Um, and I think there were a number of reasons for this, but you know, these neuropsychologists were experimentalists um, and they didn't make a lot of home visits where they carefully and systematically observed how the subjects behaved outside of experimental conditions. So I think probably, I think their behavior was more disrupted and disunified than is normally recognized. Uh, admittedly, there's not enough data here, but there was, so far as I know, just a single study devoted to systematically observing how split brain subjects behave in their day-to-day -day lives. And that study did turn up a lot of, you know, again, a lot of disunities in their behavior. Um, yeah. so I argue in the book for duality of consciousness and agency and uh, psychology generally. I, I argue for the two subjects of experience claim, the two agents claim, and the two thinkers claim in the book. And, and do you also argue I, I against it? If you think that consciousness, you know, if you want to argue, if you want to, if you're using some kind of functional theory of consciousness, according to which to have a unified consciousness is to be able to do certain things with your conscious experiences, then I think that ultimately, you know, again, once you think that there are two streams of consciousness, that at least lends a good deal of preliminary support to thinking that there are two thinkers and two agents also. Right. Um, and so I'm obviously I'm curious about, you know, and I know you kind of, uh, you don't believe in, in, in mind brain duality. Right. Um, but given your observations, I guess if you look at 
the, the notion, regardless of, yeah. you know, if you believe it or not, but you look at the notion of mind brain duality. Yeah. In, in your studies of this, have you seen anything that gave you pause or any kind of evidence or anything that you thought to yourself, these two brains are acting, you know, with uh, different perspectives or maybe even possibly different agencies. But I, I feel like there is a single mind that right. envelops both sides. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because <clears throat> I argue for these various duality positions, but it's difficult even for me to accept them because even though I think split brain subjects, it does seem as though they behave in a more disunified fashion outside of experimental conditions than is normally recognized, or at least that seems, you know, that seems to be the conclusion mm -hmm. of the paper devoted to looking at this. When I say they act in a disunified fashion, they still don't seem like two people. Um, they still, each of them still seems like one of us with some problems rather than like two of us strapped together in one body. So they don't seem like two people right. run like a two legged race or something like that. Um, and right. so it's a serious challenge, obviously, to these duality claims. I mean, it's a very powerful impression, the impression that each of them is at the end of the day, more like one of us than like two of us. And so it's a major, you know, in the second half of the book, I have to take on this challenge of accounting for that. Um, why is it that each of them seems, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, more like one of us than like two of us. And, you know, some of the reasons might be, you know, again, very simple reasons that, well, you know, they have one face and, you know, all their speech issues out of one mouth. And, you know, we've evolved yeah. I, we've evolved to distinguish people basically by distinguishing between animals. Um, you know, we don't look at an animal and then regard it as an open question. How many, we don't look at a human being and regard it as an open question. How many persons there are there? Um, right. We see a single pair of eyes looking at us and we think, yeah, you know, one of us psychologically speaking as well. And even if that person behaves in a very, disunified way they really you know they don't seem to have a very stable character or personality or they're always going back on what they said or they're always contradicting themselves we just think what is wrong with this guy we don't think oh there's multiple guys there um right you know and so that that's one class of reason but the other reason is something that i mentioned to you before these two psychological beings let's call them righty and lefty that you know by hypothesis sh are sharing a body they don't appear to recognize each other's existence. And so when lefty is speaking, you know, if righty does something under experimental conditions and you ask the subject, well, why did you do that? And lefty replies, lefty doesn't say, well, which one of us are you talking to? Or, you know, lefty doesn't say, well, why are you asking me? Why don't you ask the right hemisphere guy? You know, and I think that if yeah. lefty were saying things like that, our intuitions would probably shift, right? We would think, oh my gosh, maybe there are two beings here, especially if Righty could speak also and if Righty were doing the same thing. Like if Righty started saying, you really need to specify which one of us you're talking to because we're confused about it, right? <laughs> which, you know, is the type of answer yeah. that the joint twin would give if they were unsure which one of them you were speaking to. You know, if, if you started to get that kind of verbal response from Righty and from Lefty, I think our intuitions would really shift. We would think, oh yeah, there's two people here. Um, even though they just look like one person. Um, but it, again, righty and lefty don't appear to be aware of each other's existence. Now, of course, that itself is a challenge for the various duality claims, because if righty and lefty, you know, if neither hemisphere system demonstrates awareness of the other's existence or demonstrates awareness of a second thinker or consciousness sharing its body, well, you know, one possible reason why is, Maybe there isn't a second thinker or consciousness sharing its body. Maybe there really is one, the only one there. So I, you know, I, I devote some time in the book explaining why I think, no, there really are these distinct consciousness and thinkers, but they, they don't really have a way. It actually makes sense that they don't recognize each other's existence. Um, because of course we do walk around with the assumption that there's just one of us here. And even though, you know, even though, righty will do something that lefty didn't do and didn't intend to do, or maybe even didn't want to do. You know, sometimes we do things that we didn't intend to do, right? Or, right. you know, we're not always aware of what we're going to do before we do it, right? We find ourselves doing things absent-mindedly that we actually didn't intend to do. Or we do things right. by accident, or we say something and we immediately regret it. 
And I think that that's how righty and lefty appear to think about the other's behavior as just things that it did accidentally or inadvertently mindedly or on the basis of some kind or, you know, unconsciously in some sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know why I did that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when you, you don't entertain it as a serious possibility when you do something absentmindedly that, Oh, maybe I didn't do that. <laughs> um, and so right. I think, Righty and lefty are making the same assumption that all of us make, that at the end of the day, there's just one of us here. Um, you know, I'll so what about the ego? Have you, you looked at the, that? if there, I don't know, is there even an ego? So it's, yeah. um, I don't know, is, is, is there a part of that where you look at a split brain individual and, and try to figure out where, where the ego is, how the ego is, if there even is an ego. I mean, assuming that we believe that there is such thing as like the quote ego. Okay. So I'll say what I take an ego to be, but you can let me know whether this is what you mean. I mean, I take an ego to be, I mean, I take it as synonymous with something like the self. Um, and it's something that you can only have if you are self-conscious so that mm -hmm. a non-self-conscious animal wouldn't have an ego. Um, is that, is that the kind of thing you mean? Like that, which is the object? Yeah, I think the I, the yeah. me. Yeah. No, I mean, but, you know, I argued that there are two of those, um, hmm. that there are these two selves in one sense. Though ultimately, I also argue that a split brain subject is one person. And, and that's because a split brain subject, I think these two, while there are these two selves and so far there are these two um, thinkers of self-conscious thoughts, um, who can interest each introspect only their own thoughts, for instance, and not that of the other. They nonetheless, there's a sense in which because they can't distinguish themselves from each other, um, you, you know, you might think that there's a single social subject um, that they're both thinking about. So for instance, neither can, neither can think of itself as the object of the other's thought, neither can feel self-conscious in the colloquial sense, in the sense of um, highly aware of how it looks to another um, in front of the other. So neither can be embarrassed in front of the other or, you know, wish it had some privacy from the other, neither is inclined to feel, you know, resentment towards the other, any of the kinds of emotions that we, the, the quote unquote, self-conscious emotions that only self-conscious beings are capable of experiencing and that we experience in front of other persons in particular, um, they don't relate to each other socially in this way. And they can't relate to each other yeah. socially in this way since they can't distinguish themselves from each other. Um, and similarly, they can't relate to other people as distinct social subjects. So in fact, you know, if you say, you know, imagine looking at a split brain subject and asking, you know, what would you like for lunch? And lefty says, you know, I want a sandwich or, you know, whatever. And then you look at the same subject right. and say, oh, what about you, righty? Do you agree? You know, nod if you agree and shake your head if you think no. I mean, the subject is going to look at you like you're crazy, again, because neither of them knows that the other <laughs> is. And I argued that the basis yeah. is that they, you know, they share a body um, to such a high degree that they have no basis for distinguishing themselves from each other. So they can't interact with each other or with other parties as distinct social beings. And so in that sense, you might think there's a single social self there. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. There's, there's a lot going on there. Cause yeah. it, it probably would be impossible. I would, I would imagine surgically, but it, it, the two brains ever been reconnected. So they haven't been reconnected and I wouldn't go so far as to say impossible uh, in so far as, you know, there is, there are neural prosthetics. Um, I remember years ago, I should look this up again, but I remember in 2014 discovering that um, scientists were at work on an um, artificial hippocampus. Um, and I mm -hmm. think it probably wasn't going to be a human hippocampus. I think they were just working on an animal uh, hippocampus, which might be um, a little simpler. But, you know, if that ends up working, right, if you can develop a prosthesis for the, the hippocampus, then, I mean, basically, it's just a scaling up problem to do the rest of the brain, as far as I'm concerned, um, right? So, sure, you could have a prosthetic uh, corpus callosum, for instance. Um, and yeah. Could that be used to introduce an, another, an artificial intelligence? So I guess my question is, I just kind of turn the whole thing around. If we split the brains, could we also introduce a, 
it, it, you can't really say a third hemisphere. That's like saying in hockey, yet there's three halves to the game. <laughs> but it's, well, um, I you, about you know that. what I mean? I'm going to say it incorrectly because yeah. I don't really know how to say it. Yeah, no. I Can mean, you introduce a third hemisphere? Yeah, presumably it's in principle possible. And I don't know what that would do to, I don't know what, I, I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's possible to predict what that would do to someone's psychology because, you know, one of the reasons the split brain studies, I mean, these subjects were such a sought after patient population. And one of the reasons they were very sought after was because, you know, it, they, uh, allowed the possibility of investigating the capacity of a single hemisphere um, independently of that of the other, not wholly, but, you know, you, to an unusual degree. Um, and so, you know, it was one way of testing hemispheric specialization. And the thought was that, well, okay, so if we can figure out the capacities of the right hemisphere, and then we can figure out the capacities and, you know, processing styles and so on of the left hemisphere, and then we can just, you know, use that to work out the capacities and the processing styles and so on of the brain as a whole. But then it turned out that actually it was a little more complicated than that, because of course the normal brain doesn't just contain a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere, but also a corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum changes the way each of these hemispheres interacting with the other hemisphere changes the way one hemisphere acts. And so then a bunch of papers started coming out with titles like, you know, the whole is more than the sum of its parts and so on. Um, and so right. I think did introduce a third hemisphere it would be really interesting but i think it would be yeah it would be hard to predict what that actually did to a person psychologically um having that third hemisphere system in there yeah 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 probably at this point not even worth worth really asking the question i was just curious oh no i think um it's yeah i don't know ai comes up a lot so i just was wondering and, I, and i've had conversations where people talk about you know, the possibility of actually connecting brains together. And when you right. connect brains together, it, be, right. it creates a third consciousness. And now there's the ethics around, yep. oh my gosh, you've created a conscious here that we, we can't just disconnect it because that would be like murdering this third okay. consciousness we created. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, that is, uh, that is quite interesting. I mean, obviously, if you do believe that, you know, there was a single psychological being in uh, you know, before split brain surgery, and now there are two psychological beings, then it's true, you did end the existence of a psychological being when you performed split right. brain surgery. Um, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's, I've thought about that a little bit. Like, you've ended the existence of a psychological being, but you haven't killed anyone. Um, and you've created two new psychological beings. So it's hard to even think about what the moral issues are there. Yeah, so normally that when person is still there. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, normally we, we know that it's wrong to destroy a conscious being, but, uh, or at least prima facie wrong. But I mean, that's because normally it means killing a being or rendering it brain dead or something like that. And of course, you're not doing anything like that when you perform a split brain surgery. So it's hard right. to say, uh, yeah, with the, how, hard to know how to morally evaluate split brain surgery. Yeah, yeah, it is. It introduces a whole new field of morality and ethics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I guess I just have a couple wrap up questions, but before I get to those, was there anything else about uh, split brain and consciousness that you wanted to get out there? Um, I will say, you know, um, so although I do believe that there are these two distinct consciousnesses or perspectives in split brain subjects, I do want to emphasize again that, um, the two hemispheres surgically divided from each other are not like two distinct brains and two bodies. Um, they do interact. It does look like some conscious information is shared in some way between the two hemispheres, even though it's unclear whether they share any particular experiences. But that's a major objection to this um, dual consciousness claim. And it's, it's one that I spend quite a lot, a lot of time on in the book. On the other hand, I also point out that, you know, um, it looks as though you can have, I point back to the case of Christiana and Tatiana Hogan, Krista and Tatiana Hogan, the conjoined twins who are joined at the level of the thalamus and say, you know, even mm -hmm. if it turns out that they share some conscious experiences and clearly, you know, their brains are neurologically joined. Um, so there's a kind of direct neural communication of conscious information between their two brains. It looks like that doesn't mean that they don't have distinct perspectives. Um, and I make the same kind of argument in the split right. brain. There's some sharing of conscious information, perhaps, but nonetheless, there's also conscious experiences within each hemisphere system that aren't shared um, by the other hemisphere system. Yeah, not not a 
not an easy distinction in, in any case. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So what, uh, what else are you going to be working on? What, what can we expect from you or see from you or what are you excited to be yeah. digging into in your future? I am continuing some split brain work and uh, right now I'm uh, kind of a participant in a grant proposal to work with the um, split brain subjects that I mentioned before in Italy. Um, So fingers Mm -hmm. crossed that that works out and that that work can go forward because there's a lot of really cool um, experiments that are planned if the... um, Yeah, that'd be great. So yeah, I'm also working on, um, I have some papers on self-deception which is another kind of psychological disunity, right? Um, where there appears to, where a person both appears to believe and disbelieve a single proposition, um, to believe one kind of automatically, but to have sort of persuaded themselves to believe um, its negation also. Um, hmm. that, or where a person appears to, you know, in the version, in the theory of self-deception that I endorse, where a person on the one hand, on the basis of, much of their behavior appears to believe one thing and yet they insist that they believe something else. Um, apparently sincerely insist that they believe something else. So that's a paper in another kind oh, interesting. of community. Yeah. Um, and that's an interesting one because of course that's a kind of psychodynamic psychological disunity. And it's, it's one that characterizes, you know, all of us, even, you know, quote unquote, normal people are vulnerable to self-deception. Um, and I also have some work on dissociative identity disorder. Um, uh, which is a dissociative condition recognized by the DSM, um, characterized by disruptions in the sense of self and agency, and also by a- amnesia um, of certain kinds. So hmm. you might, um, you know, have someone who, whenever they're in one kind of mood, they actually are unable to access memories formed while they were in um, a, a very different mood, or they might go through a period of time in which they can only remember. There might be a period of time in which they claim they're only able to remember, you know, experiences from, you know, the past week and then from some years before that, but there's a large gap in their memory. Um, right. And account for. And dissociative identity disorder is interesting because it's another one of these cases, which has raised sort of personal identity questions. So imagine that you have a subject with dissociative identity disorder who, Every time they're gambling, they can remember other times when they've gambled. But every time they're not gambling, they can't remember other times when they've gambled. Well, one philosophical interpretation of this kind of case is that, oh, there's at least two psychological beings in the subject with DID or dissociative identity disorder. There's one who gambles and enjoys gambling and can remember having gambled in the past. And there's another psychological being who never gambles and therefore can't remember having gambled in the past. Wow. Uh, So I'm working on... I'm working on... uh, I have a couple of papers on dissociative identity disorder. One is on the proper psychological theory of DID. And the other is actually on partner responses to dissociative identity disorder. So you have sometimes romantic partners who claim to accept that they are dating only one of these psychological beings within the DID subject. And then they're not dating the other psychological beings, um, for instance. Hmm. And I'm, I'm looking into whether they really believe that or whether that's just something they kind of claim to believe or are committed to believing, but at a deeper level, they actually don't really accept that. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is, that is fascinating. I can see that shedding some light on consciousness. I think uh, I may have to reach back out to you and see if you have another free hour oh, to, sure. to talk to me once you get some of that out there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'd be very happy to. Well, that'd be awesome. Well, I, I, look forward to that. I really appreciate your time today. This has been a fascinating conversation that's leaving me with a lot to think about. So I just wanted to thank you again for for doing this and and sharing your expertise with everybody. Well, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's been really great. And it's, yeah, it's been really great talking to you. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the Consciousness Podcast and our Twitter handle at ConchCast. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed at theconsciousnesspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.